So there are like 8 billion people alive on Earth today. But the burning question is how many more can the Earth really hold? Like, I don't know, maybe a trillion? Or what if when the 9 billionth person is born, it's just too much and so the apocalypse begins and we all have to live in handmade canoe communities in the middle of the ocean? The point is, these are questions that geographers ask all the time and they have everything to do with the consequences of population distribution and density and I'll tell you about four of them in this video. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked carrying capacity style, well, let's get to it. So first, population distribution and density density affect political processes. In other words, where people live and how dense those populations are in those places can change power structures in various ways. For example, here in the United States, the federal government is constitutionally mandated to take a census every 10 years. And that just means that every decade, citizens are required to report where they live, their gender, their income, their religion, their pant size, etc. Big daddy government doesn't really want to know your pant size. Don't write that down. Anyway, one of the main reasons that they collect all that data is to find out where people live, which is to say the population distribution. And the reason that matters to them them is because U.S. population distribution is directly tied to representation in Congress. Oh, and by the way, if you want note guides to follow along with this video, then get that clicky finger out and check out the link in the description. Now, in case you don't know, Congress has two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. And between these two houses, all of our federal laws are made. Now, for our purposes, the Senate doesn't matter. But in the House, each state has a number of representatives proportional to their population. So if the census finds out that millions of people moved from Washington to Montana, then Washington is going to lose seats in the House while Montana will gain Seats. So in this case, population distribution is affecting the power that various states can have. Okay, population distribution and density numbers also affect economic processes, which is to say how money is spent both for public and private services. Like if an area's population is growing rapidly, businesses have more incentive to open stores and offices in those locations, and the opposite is true in places with decreasing population. For example, this area right here is known as the Rust Belt, and that's because it used to be an economic powerhouse in the United States that focused on manufacturing. But around the 1950s, manufacturing jobs were increasing increasingly sent to other countries, and so in this region, people lost their jobs and the factories got, you know, all rusty. And in that time, these regions have experienced a shrinking population as people have moved elsewhere for jobs. Additionally, governments may also allocate money for infrastructure projects based on whether populations are growing or declining. Like where populations are dense, it makes way more sense to spend those sweet government dollars on roads and bridges and hospitals and schools, etc. But third, population distribution and density numbers also affect social processes. For example, in the densest human settlements, which is to say cities, the quality of education tends to be higher. Additionally, because of larger police forces, cities tend to be safer, which I know sounds crazy, but statistically, it's true. But dense populations can also affect family structures by removing the nuclear family from the larger generational family unit. And I could go on, but let's turn to the final consequence of distribution and density, namely effects on the environment. So as population grows in various places, more pressure is put on land and water sources to provide basic necessities for humans to survive. And not only that, but pollution can be a big factor in dense areas too. For example, big cities like Delhi or Mexico City or Los Angeles tend to have pretty nasty air quality. But under this heading, one of the most pressing questions human geographers ask concerns the exhaustion of Earth's resources. And for that, let me introduce you to the concept of carrying capacity, which refers to the maximum population an environment can support. So back to our original question, how many people can the Earth actually support? Well, here's where I tell you that there's not really a tidy answer, like, you know, nine billion and one. Some geographers say that we're way past the Earth's carrying capacity, and tomorrow we're gonna be living in our canoe cities. But others argue that the carrying capacity is over a trillion. But the reason why this number varies so much is because so many factors affect the outcome, factors like climate and agricultural productivity. And then to further complicate the matter, not all populations use the same amount of natural resources. Wealthy populations around the world tend to use more resources than they need, and that usually means that other populations have less than they need. So, you know, if everyone used only the resources they needed to survive, then carrying capacity might be easier to determine. But they don't, so it's not. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 2, and click here to grab my note guides for this video and all my videos so you can get the content of this course firmly crammed into your brain folds. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lerout.